From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. This is where the world of politics meets the world of business. I'm David Weston. We're going to start today with news out of the Treasury Department as the Biden administration starts to get more specific about how it wants to increase corporate tax receipts. Bloomberg's international economics and policy correspondent Michael McKee is here with the latest. So they're going to find a lot of dimes and nickels in the cushions, it looks like, Mike. <laughs> they're looking more for Benjamins, David, I think. Uh, this is a bigger deal than coins. Uh, we already know the what of the Biden tax plan. This is more about the why. It's sort of the sales pitch the administration is going to use. The Biden plan says that companies that make more than $2 billion in revenue a year will have to pay a minimum tax of 15 percent. The basic philosophy and the practice of companies shifting profits to tax havens make them pay something. So 15 percent, even though the headline rate is about 28 percent. Now, Treasury says about 180 companies would meet that target, but only about 45 a year would actually have to pay more, about $300 million a year each. Using figures from the nonpartisan Congressional Joint Committee on Taxation, the administration says U.S.-based companies operating globally collectively paid just 7.8 percent in effective taxes last year, or in 2018, rather. That was the first year under the Trump tax cut. Across member countries, the OECD corporate tax revenue estimates are equivalent to an average of 3.2 percent of GDP, while in the U.S., just 1 percent. That's the lowest level since World War II. Treasury says the changes over a decade would reclaim about $700 billion in tax revenue from shifting profits overseas and, all told, the extra revenue of about $2.5 trillion over 15 years would pay for Biden's spending proposals. The spending proposals only last eight years aimed at infrastructure, of course, uh, green energy investments and social programs. Yeah, powerful numbers. We'll see whether Joe Manchin really pays attention to about in West Virginia. Thank you so much to Michael McKee. President Biden comes to office trying to restore some of the international relations disrupted by his predecessor. And that includes trying to work with other countries on our approach to corporate taxes. French Finance Minister Bruno Le Maire told our colleague Francine Lacqua exclusively that he's hopeful that that just might work. We are not far from an agreement within the OECD. And uh, I really want to um, uh, say how important uh, the decisions and the statements made by Janet Yellen are for all of us, because there is a unique window of opportunity to uh, have a new international taxation system which would be more efficient and fairer. For his sense of just how realistic all this might be, we welcome now Ian Bremmer. He's founder and president of Eurasia Group and of G0. So, Ian, always great to have you with us. I mean, you've written about the fact that the world seems to be going in different directions, even as President Biden tries to bring it together. Is there a chance of bringing at least the OECD countries together on corporate taxation? Uh, certainly there's a desire uh, to have more coordination. I, I don't think that Le Maire is lying when he says he welcomes it, but you have to get it through the United States right now. That means Congress, and that also means over time. I was actually briefing uh, Senate Intel Committee uh, yesterday morning. The biggest laugh line I got was when I said, look, you guys just need to throw Manchin more money. Uh, <laughs> right? He's the most powerful person in the United States government right now. And, uh, you know, his resistance uh, to new taxes to pay for the trillions of dollars that we're talking about in infrastructure um, is, is significant. So let's let's first see where the U.S. legislature gets, and let's also see, you know, over time uh, how how consistent they're going to be. I mean, there's a good chance that the House actually swings back to the Republicans uh, next November. This is a challenge for a United States that is trying to do things that's more strategic and more global over time. What about one specific issue uh, addressing trade in some ways, and that's the issue of digital taxation, where there have been a lot of back and forth between the United States and Europe in particular. France at one point was going to impose digital tax. Do you think we can come to terms on that? That's certainly an area where the Americans and the EU at the highest level are saying they want to come to an agreement. There is a desire to cooperate um, to avoid this being a hit on both, because we recognize that if there's no agreement on digital tax with the Europeans, that they are going to get hit with a, with a, with a swath of American tariffs that they do not want themselves. So at the very least, uh, I think the ability to spend more time, take a breath, and negotiate more effectively between both sides is significant right now. The Americans are facing much more. We see the Chinese right now as our top competitor. 
And unlike the Trump administration, which also felt that way, but was willing to make economic fights at the same time with the Mexicans, the Canadians successfully, the South Koreans successfully, the Europeans not so successfully, the Biden administration really does want to actually uh, focus more on the Chinese and get the Europeans on, more on board. Wants to. Uh, but the question is, and you've really teed this up in some of your writings, Ian, is it more and more difficult because there's increasing divergence. There's divergence when it comes to the vaccination rates and when it comes to COVID-19 and certainly the economy. Take a look at the U.S. versus Europe and then forget about some of the low and middle income countries who are really getting left behind. Does that make the Biden task even more difficult? You know, you could make the argument it makes it a little bit easier. Uh, there is a desire on the part of the Biden administration to spend the first year just focusing overwhelmingly on the two priorities that matter most for his popular support. That's number one, getting the vaccines out, crushing the virus as fast as you can. The U.S. is the world leading economy right now among large economies in doing that. And secondly, trillions and trillions of dollars of relief and stimulus badly needed, especially in the economy that is the most unequal of all of the G7, and then turning internationally. If you don't have a foreign policy that is seen to matter for the middle class in the United States, you're going to get hammered. So, I mean, you know, it's not like the U.S. is going to say, let's do the Trans-Pacific Partnership again. That's not Biden's story. But I will tell you, David, I am so much more optimistic about the United States foreign policy influence in the next 24 months because the vaccines are successful. By this summer, the U.S. is going to be in a position to export a significant number of vaccines because they've actually gotten them in arms of Americans first and quickly. That does create more flexibility for U.S. diplomacy going forward. I wonder if there could be more flexibility as well in the form of the IMF, believe it or not. Those are the meetings going on right now. As you know, a big issue on the agenda, it looks like it probably is going to go forward, you would know better than I, is the substantial increase in the special drawing rights. Uh, right. There are some proposals coming out of, for example, Rockefeller Foundation saying you could use some of the unused special drawing rights to actually support vaccination programs in the poorest countries, sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, places like that. Is there a connection potentially between the SDRs on the one hand, we hear a lot about, on the other hand, bringing the rest of the world along with us. That, that kind of earmarking would be unprecedented uh, for uh, use of SDRs, but I am told that it's likely to happen because it's so obvious in terms of the entire international community that that's the way to get these lower and, and uh, developed countries uh, back on their feet as quickly as possible. And, and this headline number, $650 billion, you know, only about 25% of those SDRs will go to lower and mid-income countries. But there is a coming agreement among the wealthier countries and China to allocate their SDRs to poorer countries. If that happens, that's actually a pretty significant win for U.S. foreign economic policy. Um, it, it's a hell of a lot greater than total amount of U.S. foreign aid to countries around the world again, at a time that it's pretty desperately needed. So I think you have to give the IMF and Madame Gorgeva uh, a lot of credit uh, for moving to get this done and a lot of multilateral diplomacy with countries that otherwise aren't seeing eye to eye as much as we'd like them to. Ian, you mentioned China. We, we can't get through this conversation without talking about China. There are now reports I'd say sort of conflicting reports about whether the United States is or is not thinking about a possible maybe if a boycott of the Olympics over in China. Where does that stand from your reporting? Oh, they're thinking about a boycott. Uh, the question is what kind of a boycott it's going to be. I think very clearly there will be some level of diplomatic boycott. Uh, the, I can't imagine U.S. political presence in Beijing during the Olympics would be anything close to what it will be in Japan, for example. And they might say no diplomats are allowed to attend. You're seeing people like Marco Rubio that are calling for companies like Delta, for example, um, to get out of China because of the Uyghurs, because of Chinese boycotts on American brands. This is becoming heavily political. But for the State Department to float the idea that there might be a boycott overall, that the Americans might pull out, I think is a huge mistake. And I think it's a mistake first and foremost because American allies are not on board with this. Most Europeans would say no. The South Koreans would say no. The Japanese, even the Japanese would not risk a backlash where the Chinese would pull out of the Japan Olympics coming up shortly. The idea that the United States would be by themselves with three or four countries of, of substance um, in pulling out of the, of the Beijing Olympics and allow the Chinese government 
to more functionally divide American allies away from the U.S. is one of the most is one of the least strategic things the Americans can be doing. I I absolutely join the Biden administration and the Republicans in significant concerns about things that are happening uh, in uh, under under Chinese uh, government rule in Hong Kong. Uh, in Taiwan, with the South China Sea, right. and of course, most importantly, the genocide against the Uyghurs. But a boycott, a full boycott against the Chinese Olympics would really not be in American interest. Okay, let's be very direct about this, Ian, if we could. I was in Washington, actually, for the Moscow Olympic boycott, and my impression was we came away from that thing and we didn't accomplish anything positive at all. Given what you just said, do you think the U.S. government is seriously considering this, or is this more something to say to some of the human rights groups who are very upset about the Uyghurs in Hong Kong, say, okay, we'll think about it, but actually there's no intention to follow through? Thinking about it and backing off only makes you look weak. So I, I suspect it was a, a gotcha uh, question by a journalist that was answered, but without suitable prep um, by a State Department spokesperson, for example. I hope this is not being seriously considered right now, even though there clearly are people in the Biden administration that are prioritizing human rights and would say absolutely no matter what, we shouldn't be there. There's obviously uh, pressure from the Republicans, too. But, you know, former President Jimmy Carter, who made that call on the Olympics boycott 1980 in Moscow, um, and in part because of the war going on in Afghanistan, later said that it was the biggest mistake that he had made as president. And he had made many, right? Uh, I mean, he was apologizing to American athletes. Uh, of course, the, the Soviets came back and boycotted the uh, American Olympics in Los Angeles. It accomplished nothing for the United States. No one went along with the U.S. It was a huge mistake. Yeah, and my old law partner, a wonderful man, a great lawyer, Lloyd Cutler, was right in the middle of that at the time. I remember Lloyd, absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. I practiced yeah. law with him. Thank you so much. Always great to have you with us, Ian. That's Ian Bremmer. He's president of the Eurasia Group and G Zero Media. For a check on how markets are reacting, we turn now to Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle. So, Abigail, I'm sorry we got to you late, but I'm not sure how much is going on. <laughs> not much at all, David. We have very, very small moves here for the major averages, fluctuating between small gains and losses. Lots of folks, traders, investors on vacation. Uh, at this time. Volumes well below average at the open, 60% below the 20-day moving average. Right now, about 20% below the 20-day moving average. Where we do have more action, though, small cap selling off. It's actually the Russell 2000 right now flirting below its 50-day its moving average. Uh, so we have a cooling off of what was thought to be such a frothy market because small cap, of course, uh, really flying on the air up until now, perhaps having something to do with taxes. Because remember, David, uh, these are not only just flying high recently, but these domestically based companies, that could be some worry about uh, uh, taxes increasing. And then finally, David, throwing into the mix bonds. We have bonds rallying once again, yields down for a third day in a row. But overall, very, very quiet, low volume day. Okay, thank you so much for the report, Abigail Doolittle. Coming up here, changing the voting rules in Georgia. We talk with Congresswoman Nakima Williams about what's going on in her home state. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David West. We have some breaking news right now. This is according to Politico. We have not matched it yet. Politico says that we're about to have some executive orders come out of the Biden administration, reportedly about uh, checks for ghost gun buyers. We will keep looking into that, and we'll keep you up to date as things develop. In the meantime, I want to turn to Georgia. Georgia, as we all know, was crucial to the 2020 election outcomes, both in the presidential race and in those two Senate runoffs. And it triggered changes to Georgia election laws that some say are designed to make it more difficult for Democrats to win in the future. We welcome now Congresswoman Nakima Williams, she who represents Georgia's 5th Congressional District. She also chairs the Georgia State Democratic Party. So, Congresswoman Williams, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, you know this situation terribly well, much better than I do. Give us a sense of what the effect of this new law will be. So, David, what we're seeing right now is we played by their rules in the 2020 election in the January runoff, and we won. And that's not sitting too well with people. And so now Republicans in our state, based on Donald Trump's big lie of voter fraud and him still thinking that he possibly won the election, they're changing the rules. They're changing the rules to make it more difficult for new voters to vote, make it more difficult for black and brown voters to vote. What we're seeing is an idea that if 
if the state legislature, the very gerrymandered state legislature does not like what is happening on the local level with county election officials, they can come in and take over what is happening and change election results. We are also seeing um, fewer drop box locations for big areas like Atlanta, Fulton County. We're seeing criminalization of someone simply giving water to someone waiting in line to vote. And I don't know if you've ever been to Georgia during a summer, but it gets really <laughs> hot. Lines are long and water for hydration. You're going to jail people. Yeah. I, I've not been waiting in a line, but I have been in Atlanta in, in the summer. It is pretty dark on hot. So there is a voting rights act. It's 1965 that you know well, and the section five provision, the Supreme court cut back on. So there's not pre-clearance to the justice department, but the Justice Department or others could bring lawsuits, as I understand it, under the Voting Rights Act. Do you encourage the Justice Department to file a suit challenging this new law? So, David, I'm of the posture that we're going to either win in the courts or we're going to win in Congress because we here in the Deep South, we know how to fight Jim Crow, and that's exactly what this is. We might not be mm. counting how many jelly beans are in a jar, but it still has the same end result. Fewer people having access to the ballot, fewer people of color having access to the ballot. And so while there are a number of lawsuits that are going on, I haven't given up on what we can do here in Congress, and that is passing H.R. 1 and H.R. 4. H.R. 1, the For the People Act, will get to the root of some of these things that have been introduced here in Georgia and give everyone in this country equal access to the ballot, regardless of where they live. It should not matter what your zip code is, what your access to the ballot is in this country. Of course, you've done your part on H.R. 1 in the House. The problem is those pesky senators on the other side of the Capitol Hill, right? Let me turn pesky to something senators. else. <laughs> pesky That's what we call them, yeah, pesky senators. Let me turn to another responsibility you have, which is infrastructure, because you're on the committee, actually, for transportation and infrastructure. There's a lot of back and forth right now about the $2.2 trillion proposal from the Biden administration. But one of the key issues seems to be almost a matter of semantics. What is infrastructure? When you look at this, what do you count as infrastructure? How do you decide if something is genuinely an infrastructure proposal? So, David, we have an opportunity to be bold and visionary right now in our country. And as we've seen throughout this pandemic, we have to reimagine what work looks like. We have to reimagine infrastructure in this country. And when we think, when I think about things like the care industry, we cannot have a jobs plan that does not take into account what care and care workers do for this country. Every other job is possible because we have care workers in this country that help us care for our children and allow people to go to work every day. And so I am pushing to make sure that we reimagine what infrastructure looks like and what keeps our country going. It's more than just bridges and roads in this country right now. Well, certainly we have things like uh, broadband uh, that I, I think many people at least would agree that really is infrastructure. But go to the care issue because I think that's something people have focused on. I understand if it's child care for people who need to go to work. But what about care for the elderly? I'm not an ageist. By the way, I'm on the wrong side of that bar, bar anyway. I'd be against myself. But it, can you really say that's infrastructure? It might be good as a social matter, but is it infrastructure to say we need to pay for people to take care of the elderly? So when you think about people in their homes right now, like the care spectrum runs from, from both ends of the gamut. And so we have so many people that are caring for their parents and um, people need to, the ability to care in place. And right now, how is that happening without having the infrastructure in this country to support it? Right now, we are at a crossroads and we have decisions to make. And I am of the mindset that we should be inclusive of what this looks like. And the human capital part of this cannot be overlooked. Uh, Congressman, there's a lot of things that need doing in this country. And again, I think most people would agree. They might not agree on the specifics. So they agree there's a lot that needs to be done. At the same time, we got to pay for it at some point. At this point, should we be concerned about the deficit and the growing debt for the country? Is At what point should we worry about that? Because most of us think sooner or later you're going to have to pay for this. Well, right now, there are already conversations underway. And we look at some of the Trump tax um, rollbacks that we should be considering to make sure that we are looking at things that were done in the past four years that probably should have never been done, David. And so we are righting a, a lot of wrongs that were done in the past four years, but we can't just look at those things. We have to move forward. And that's what we're, that's what the Biden administration is doing. That was the whole point of the Build Back Better. We're not just going back to where we were four years ago. We're doing things better. We're making sure that people have economic opportunities that were never there before. And me as a Black woman in the South, that is of critical importance to me as I continue to represent my communities. We deserve the ability to thrive and not just survive. 
You're here. Thank you so much, Congressman. Really good to have you with us. That's Representative Nakima Williams. She's a Democrat of Georgia. Coming up, getting the boats back in the water. Carnival Cruise Lines is our stock of the hour. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Cruise lines got hit about as hard as anybody by the pandemic shutdown. But now things are showing some signs they might be getting better. And for the story, we turn now to our colleague, Emma Chandra. Emma. David, I'm talking about Carnival here, the cruising juggernaut out with some uh, earnings today. But I want to start with the bad news because we saw a loss of almost $2 billion in the first quarter of this year. That is on top of $10 billion loss last year, uh, of course, dealing with the fallout from the pandemic. But when you compare that with how the stock is performing today, it doesn't really make sense because we're looking at a 7% uh, increase at the highs when you look at Carnival. Uh, the reason for this is bookings. They are accelerating. Uh, bookings in the first quarter up 90% compared with the fourth quarter of last year. The CEO saying that this is what's happened with minimal advertising, minimal marketing, and really points to pent up demand for cruising, for vacations. And they say they have the liquidity, they're ready to start operations again. Of course, the tension there with the government about when that will be allowed. But the reason they have that liquidity, despite all of these losses, David, of course, that is because they have tapped the corporate bond market uh, over the past 12 months some five times, uh, refinancing really uh, in February, but the four times before that really just for general purposes. And that's really allowed them to pad pad their balance sheet um, and allow them really to be in a position to return uh, to operations. And certainly that's something we're seeing across the cruising industry in terms of how the stocks have performed over the last year, doing really well, some triple digit gains. The expectation, of course, is that they will be able to bounce back, David. Uh, did we get any indication of bookings? Are they coming back? They are. Booking's really coming back. They're expecting uh, people uh, really to come back, as I said, up 90 percent uh, in the first quarter compared uh, with the last quarter. So the CEO very happy uh, with people really uh, wanting to come back and use their services. Thank you so much to Emma Chandra for that report on Carnival. We're going to have more on Carnival when CEO Arnold Donald joins us this afternoon. That's at 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Coming up, we're going to talk about possible tax implications of President Biden's infrastructure plan with Michael Pugliese. He is Wells Fargo economist. This is My Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on Bloomberg Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. The global shortage of microchips is hitting a range of businesses hard, so hard that the Biden administration reportedly is meeting with CEOs next Monday to see what it can do about it. Bloomberg is airing a special on the subject tonight, hosted by our Bloomberg technology anchor, Emily Chang, and we welcome her now. Emily, great to have you with us. Such a timely special. Give us a sense. Is there anything really the administration can do about this problem? So look, chip companies have been lobbying for tax breaks for a really long time, but the big question is, can Biden do anything in time to alleviate this chip shortage? The shortage right now has been devastating. We're talking about a crisis in the global economy, car makers in the United States, plants idle because they can't get the chips that they need. And part of the reason this is happening is because of the pandemic, the demand for laptops, home appliances, home networking gear, all of those things need chips and there just simply aren't enough. There isn't enough supply to meet the demand. So the White House has invited the CEOs of major chip companies, major car companies to this summit on April 12th. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan will be there. National Economic Council Director Brian Deese will be there. We know the CEO of Intel is going. We know the CEO of Global Foundries is going, one of the biggest chip foundries in the United States. And they're going to be asking for things like tax breaks and talking about likely China. A uh, big concern that China has been stockpiling chips uh, and, and was stockpiling chips through the trade war with the United States towards the end of the Trump administration. Is that still a problem? And what does it mean for U.S. competitiveness? Um, we're going to have this big special coming up later on Bloomberg Technology. Over the last few weeks, we've interviewed the CEOs of Intel, IBM, 
Qualcomm about this shortage. We're going to be speaking to the CEO of Micron, the biggest maker of flash memory chips. So what stores photos in your phone, for example, the CEO of Global Foundries, um, the, the, the guy at Amazon who is running their chip division. So in part because of the difficulties in the semiconductor in industry, you're seeing companies like Apple and Amazon and Google and Microsoft make their own chips. It's a whole new dynamic. So we're going to be talking about all of that, why the shortage is happening, how long it will last coming up on Bloomberg Technology. Okay, Emily, thank you so much for joining us. I say you couldn't have a more timely special than that one. Thanks so much to Bloomberg Technology anchor Emily Chang. Be sure to catch Chip Crunch, that's the name of the special, on Bloomberg Technology today at 5 p.m. Eastern Time and 2 p.m. out in San Francisco where Emily is. Happening right now at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida, SpaceX is set to launch 60 Starlink satellites from Space Launch Complex 40. We're going to continue to show you this launch for our TV audiences, if you can see it, and to bring you the highlights. But in the meantime, we are going to turn from the chip shortage and the space launch to the question of taxes back down here on Earth. The Biden administration is proposing a $2.2 trillion in what it calls infrastructure and plans to pay for most of it through increased taxes. Wells Fargo Securities has done a study of what is being considered and its economic consequences. And we welcome now Wells Fargo economist Michael Puglisi. So, Michael, thank you so much for being with us. You have this exhaustive study. Give us a sense of what we know so far. There's a lot I know we don't know, but what do we think we know? Yeah, thanks for having me, David. So what we know so far is we have the American Jobs Plan, which is $2.25 trillion in new spending, over eight years, at least by the administration's count. And that's comprised of some money for transportation. So think roads, bridges, airports, public transit. And then there's lots of money beyond that into other areas that have been deemed infrastructure. So water and power infrastructure, access to long-term care, research and development, manufacturing. And then on the non-spending side, so on the revenue side, there's predominantly a focus on corporate income tax increases. So by our count, you're talking maybe over the rest of this decade about 1.25, 1.5 trillion in corporate income tax increases. If you stretch it out to 15 years, because these tax increases would be permanent, probably more like $2 trillion, like the administration has discussed. And again, those are really focused on the corporate side. So a corporate rate from 21 to 28 percent, a 15 percent minimum tax on book income, and then lots of changes to how taxes are done on an international side with guilty and some other areas like that. So that's what we know so far on the actual policy side. So, Michael, on television, we continue to watch this SpaceX launch, which we're waiting for any moment now. M Michael, uh, we heard from the Treasury Department today making, uh, it struck me as a fairly powerful point, corporations really complain about this. A lot of people complain about increasing corporate taxes. At the same time, if you, if you look at corporate taxation as a percentage of overall revenue in the United States, percentage of GDP, it has gone down substantially since World War II. It's really much below a lot of OECD countries. So is there any real problem from an economic point of view? Oh, here we have, this is the space launch going off for radio. We're now seeing it lift off. This is the Falcon 9 booster, which will take this up, as I say, 60 Starlink satellites will be going up into orbit, and then, of course, they will be landing the booster back down. It's been used before in missions. They'll be landing that back down on their drone ship. I love the name of it. It's called Of Course I Still Love You. That's out in the Atlantic Ocean. They'll be landing that back down shortly. So we'll keep watching that on TV as we return now to Michael Puglisi. So, so Michael, what I was asking was, is there any real negative economic effect of increasing corporate taxation, given the fact that as a percentage of GDP, it's been going down in the United States for a good long time? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, some of the reasons those declines have happened are structural changes, both in the U.S. economy and in the global economy. Some of that's just the way those statistics are constructed. So in the U.S., we've got a corporate sector, but more broadly, we have a business sector. And that business sector has a lot of pass-through businesses. This was a big focus in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, where, yes, we had changes to the corporate income tax code, but we also had changes to the pass-through tax code. And when you include those changes, uh, revenue as a share of GDP on the business side isn't as low as it seems. But some of this is just changes over time in terms of how corporate taxes are done. This isn't just a U.S. phenomenon. You've seen a race to the bottom to some extent as companies have cut corporate income taxes as production and where it occurs is not as clear today as it was, say, 50 or 60 years ago when we were a production-dominated economy. And that's made it a lot harder to figure out exactly how some of these corporate income taxes should be imposed on companies. And as a result, that revenue has declined not just here in the U.S., but across the OECD more broadly. And to the question of does this have an economic harm, it's really hard to say, particularly until we have some de additional details there. You know, you take money out of corporations' hands, that's going to reduce private investment to some extent. On the other hand, you're, you're talking about much more public investment. 
a big difference compared to the American Rescue Plan, which was much more about income support and transfer payments. And when you look at public investment in the United States over the last several decades, it has been on a downward decline. So there's certainly some good reasons to believe that you could get an upward economic boost from more public investment. Well, that is one of the things you pointed out in your report, that there's a big difference between these transfer payments, as you say, the American Rescue Plan, which was not even trying to be about infrastructure, and what they're talking about now, at least theoretically, if it is truly for infrastructure, it would be an investment, like a capital investment, that would redound to the benefit of the economy over the longer term. It takes longer to get into the economy, but theoretically, if they do it the right way, productivity should go up, right? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. That's something we've really been stressing is don't get too lost in the headline numbers. That's something I get asked about a lot is, you know, we just did $2 trillion. What is this next $2 trillion going to do to the economy? And I think about it a lot differently. The $2 trillion we got in the American Rescue Plan was, one, entirely deficit financed. So it was putting money into the economy without taking any out. And two, that number over 10 years is really only spent in the first year or two. Right? The checks are a one-time payment made very quickly. The unemployment benefits expire in 2021. And so it's $2 trillion, but it's $2 trillion up front. A 2 to $3 trillion infrastructure package or infrastructure and social welfare package is going to be spent over years, maybe even decades. And so I think about that a lot less as supercharging near-term growth, inflation expectations, or changing the Fed's reaction function. And I think about it a lot more as what might this do to medium to long-term economic growth as we substitute some private investment for public investment. But Michael, I assume that that makes it really important to figure out what is infrastructure and what isn't, something that's being debated right now. Uh, as an economist, what are the investments that make sense that really do benefit the economy over time as opposed to really more just expenses? How, do, how would you set up a system for deciding, yes, that is truly infrastructure, that one not so much? Yeah, it's a great question, David. And I would worry a little bit less as an economist about the terms, you know, what is infrastructure and what's not, and more, what are the economic implications of the specific policies? You hit on the key word there just a moment ago, productivity growth. That's what drives higher living standards over the medium to long run. And what could drive that? Well, anything that gives us more investment in capital, right? We already have private capital. We've talked about that. Public capital could be anything from hard capital, roads, bridges, the things we typically think of it as infrastructure, and also soft infrastructure, education, and other areas like that. If it makes it easier to lure individuals into the workforce with things like universal pre-K or enhancing education through free community college, those are areas where you could get additional productivity gains in the future beyond just those public capital investments. So I'm not worried as an economist too much about the terms, so much as I am, what are these individual policies going to do to boost capital investment and to induce more individuals to come into the labor force and work? Makes great good sense. Thank you so much, Michael, for being with us. Michael Bluglisi, he is Wells Fargo economist. And we continue to keep an eye here on this Falcon 9 boost that's sending up the 60 Starlink satellites. We'll keep you posted on that as it develops. But in the meantime, we want to turn to a really timely issue, and that is Jamie Dimon. He issued his annual letter from J.P. Morgan today. One of the headlines was his warning about the future, saying, quote, fintech and big tech are here big time, exclamation points in there. Fintech companies here and around the world are making great great strides in building both digital and physical banking products and services. Welcome now to one of those who has been at the forefront of building those products. He's Marty Chavez. He's senior advisor to Sixth Street Partners and earlier served as the CFO and CIO of Goldman Sachs. So, Mr. Chavez, thank you so much for being with us. That understates all the things you've accomplished in Silicon Valley and elsewhere, but it gets us started at least. Sure. Give, us, give us your sense, because you really have been involved in this at Goldman and elsewhere. Uh, what is the challenge? I won't call it threat, but the challenge to traditional banks posed by fintech right now? Sure. Well, the way I would look at it, and actually taught a whole class at, the, at Stanford GSB on exactly this topic, how software ate finance uh, last spring. And the course has one thesis, which is that the way finance is playing out, it's actually arrived. There are all these old di dichotomies. Uh, you're on the buy side or you're on the sell side. You're a trader or a salesperson or you're in IT, right? Those categories are all disappearing fast. And it's all becoming, you are a producer of some banking and financial services, and you've wrapped them in a computer interface, the so-called API, and then you're consuming APIs from lots of other people. And if you're not a world-class producer of these APIs around your products and services, you're dead. 
and you might just not know it yet. So in that sense, I would, I would say what Jamie is saying, I, I agree with him, um, but it means that banks have to get really great at digitizing at technology. And also many banks, not all, have been great and they have been doing this for a long time. So, so it's a fascinating distinction to me. I come out of media and I watched as people in garages overtook a lot of media. And certainly the media companies had a lot of money, the way the banks have a lot of money, they have a lot of people, a lot of expertise. At the same time, they don't necessarily have the flexibility or the entrepreneurship or the willingness and ability to take risks that the startups do. How can the banks compete with some of these new startups who can take a lot more risks and be a lot more innovative a lot faster? Well, many banks have been working on this for a long time. So, for instance, one of the one of the things that we worked on very effectively at Goldman Sachs for years um, is a group we call the Principal Strategic Investments. It was in the trading division, and the idea is go out and find these startups, and sometimes collaborate with clients and and also with competitors to create some of these startups and participate early on in the cycle of innovation and become an investor and a customer of the startups and learn from them. That's been an incredibly successful journey for Goldman and other banks have done variants of it as well. How do you address the build or buy question? And by buy, I guess I include aqua hires where you may be <laughs> buying a small company in part because of the talent that you're getting with it. Well, I'm really glad you asked that one because uh, a long time ago at Goldman, when I joined in the early 90s, we used to say the only thing crazier than building all your own software is not building all your own <laughs> software. And we used to we used to pride ourselves and think that was really fun to say that. And we were all so serious about it. But a lot of the software that was needed simply didn't exist in the early 90s. And so it was absolutely the right strategy then. But as time passed, we, we changed that strategy and we realized that was no longer working, um, that the world had transformed. There were cloud services, APIs, amazing new tools, and the idea of building it all your own didn't make any sense. And so the new, the new waterfall is first order of business, we would, like, we would like it to be an open source. We would like to use software that's out there, um, freely available, and participate in the creation of that open source. If that's not going to work, then the next position is let's, let's look for some vendors and we want them to operate according to universal standards. And so we can hold the vendors to account on their reliability and cost and other things. But if it doesn't work, we can switch to another provider, same API. And then the last resort is uh, we will go build it ourselves. And in there, you find all kinds of opportunities to hire people. And of course, aqua hiring uh, happens all the time. <laughs> so it's an abuse of the term probably to call it open source, but let's talk about blockchain, which is okay. open at least, right? Everybody can check it out uh, and talk about, we all talk about Bitcoin, but I want to talk really about central bank digital currency because I know you're involved in that. And I've talked increasingly with people who are saying they are really seriously looking at this. The Fed, certainly we have Jay Powell saying he's working with MIT on something. We have yeah. a lot of central banks around the world looking at that seriously. Why are they looking at it and where does it take us potentially? Sure, so um, I find this topic so interesting that the entire first uh, module of the course I taught last year was about, about money. Um, blockchains are super interesting. Um, caveat, they're distributed databases. Distributed databases are notoriously difficult to administer, um, yet they let you do some interesting things. People often conflate the term of a distributed database or blockchain with a certain level of fault tolerance, right? So we've all heard that if half of the mining computers in the Bitcoin network are suborned, um, then the network fails, but you need to get to half. That kind of extreme fault tolerance is very expensive. And so I still don't know what form exactly central bank digital currencies will take. It's not 100% clear at all that they need to be on a blockchain. They certainly need to be highly distributed, privacy protecting and fault tolerant. There's a geopolitical overlay. So we've seen some sovereigns such as China very aggressively introducing a digital currency. And you know, I, I'm not privy to their conversations, but sure, I would love to have international trade priced in that currency as opposed to dollars. 
On the other hand, everybody's going to be really skeptical that maybe the surveillance of another state or sovereign attaches to someone's use of their digital currency. And so privacy protection while achieving anti-money laundering and know your client, these are all very, very difficult balances. But I'll go back to something I said 10 years ago when I was talking to one of the early Bitcoin CEOs, and I think it's related to where you started the conversation. I said 10 years ago, I am highly confident that the Fed will continue the digitization of the US dollar, and one day it will be a digitally native asset, effectively a cryptocurrency. And he said that will never happen. And I said, well, I don't use never, <laughs> and I'm sure it will happen. And there's this divide, East Coast, West Coast, the sort of a little bit of thinking in Silicon Valley that those people in New York and DC will never figure it out they will figure it out. Well, well, one of the things that I'm curious about is we tend to think of cryptocurrency, we all think about Bitcoin because it got there first and has the biggest name, as sort yeah. of a way of speculating and developing assets and value and things like that. There's another possible use here, as I understand it, which is to yeah. really redo our payment system. We actually had Chair Powell say, you know, one of the things we found in COVID-19 was how vulnerable our payment system is. Yeah. We have the SIFT payment, SWIFT payment system, which is really yes. pretty long in the tooth at this point. Yes. Is there a potential in the near future to basically have cryptocurrency, digital currency, whatever we call it, replace our payment system? Yes, there absolutely is. And you can see the foreshadowing of that. I know you were watching closely during the congressional deliberations in the depths of the pandemic, and you might've remembered one version, a house version of the early stimulus bill directed the Federal Reserve to create a digital US dollar and distribute them to Americans. And I remember thinking, that's a really great idea. Maybe I'll just sit down and code that up over the weekend. Right? <laughs> the point is that, that that is a huge, huge, huge project. And there's an opportunity both for wholesale and retail to continue modernizing the payment system. We've been electronified and digitized for a long time. Your bank account is an entirely digital construct. The question is, do we want it to be account-based? Do we want it to be like the paper dollar bills we have, except it's a digital token? These are all topics that are very actively being debated right now. And what role do we want the regulators to have, the Federal Reserve or other central banks to have or not? Because we have digital dollars, I guess we could call them right now, because there are cryptocurrencies that are tied, specifically like Tether, to the US dollar. So those are like digital dollars. That's different from the, the central bank, though, actually creating these, is that right? Absolutely. I, I start off uh, old school a little bit, um, even though I grew up in Silicon Valley, as an extreme skeptic of stable coins. To me, stable coins are stable until they're not, just like any currency peg that ever existed. I remember when the Argentine peso was pegged to the dollar and it was great. You could choose at the ATM and it depended on a currency board doing what they said they were going to do to keep that one for one. And that's the challenge with all of these stable coins. And so I think there's a, there is a necessity absolutely for there really to be a digital dollar, meaning it is a claim on the United States of America and simultaneously on the Federal Reserve, not something that's close to that. I think it is inevitable that we will get there. And I would not dismiss the power of the sovereign, right? Go back and, yeah. and read your political science, right? The Leviathan, uh, the yeah. sovereign can demand that you pay your taxes in the currency that it issues. And that's what breaks the circularity of fiat currency. Yeah, uh, look, look at Henry VIII or Elizabeth I. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it didn't work very well when they went up against the sovereign. But you said there's, there's a necessity. Is there an urgency? You mentioned China before, and I have read that China is really pressing hard. They've essentially, I think, eliminated the ability for p private parties to buy Bitcoin in China, but they are pressing hard on a central bank digital currency. Yes. Does that put pressure on us to compete with China on that? Well, there have been a lot of conversations on this topic. And, and look, I will just give you a point of view. And as I said, I'm obviously not uh, 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 privy to the conversations inside uh, the Chinese government. But if I were thinking about it from their perspective, and I assume they are thinking of all these things, I'd say, okay, we have a closed capital account. On the other hand, what if international trade could all be priced in yuan and everything exchanged frictionless in, in, in exchange for digital yuan? 
maybe I would open up the capital account. Oh, well then will people actually hold the digital yuan? Well, I'd have to get them really comfortable on privacy and it can't just be trust us. It would have to be mathematically, cryptographically guaranteed privacy. And so you can be absolutely sure that these conversations are happening. And over here, there've been parallel conversations. Many of them took the form that the global reserve currency depends on things such as political might and economic stability and trade policy. And of course it does. But the discussions then a year ago were more like, oh, digital is just a format. It's not all that important. That tone has shifted. And the thing that's really crucial here is it isn't just a digital format. Once currency becomes programmable, it is no longer this inert thing like a paper bill that just sits there and can be exchanged from one person to another. It's a thing that can compute and have a kind of digital life of its own. Once that happens, it is a completely different ball game. And that is the geopolitical risk that I and many are concerned about and think it's a matter of urgency for the U.S. dollar to digitize in, in, in a smart way. We're speaking with Marty, Marty Chavez for our radio audiences of Six Straight Partners. So Marty, just to make sure I understand what I think you just said, we cannot be complacent about developing a central bank digital currency here in the United States because it actually may be a way for China, for example, to undermine our status as the U.S. dollar as the dominant reserve currency. Is that right? That, that is exactly what I'm saying. We take it for granted that the dollar is the global reserve currency, and it has been so since Bretton Woods. I would also observe, not that the past is a predictor of the future, that the global reserve currency has changed a few times, and it changes about every 100 years, right? It was sterling before, before that it was Spanish uh, pieces of eight. There, there's been a lot of variants of it, and so yeah, I am very concerned, and I think the Chinese really have to do it as a matter of expressing their own interests. They will see the value in a digital global reserve currency. They have the might and the credibility to pull that off. There are a lot of concerns, especially their closed capital account and general concerns about how private would it really be if you held an awful lot of this? Would it be the right amount of privacy? So there's open questions, huge opportunity for the US here and threat. Mario, what a great conversation. I, I at least learned an awful lot. I, these are things I was curious about. And I learned a lot. Thank you so much to Marty Chavez. He's former yeah. Goldman Sachs CFO and Six Street Partners senior advisor. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. We have some breaking news right now. We started this hour talking to Ian Bremmer about the possibility of a boycott of Chinese Olympics. Well, Jen Psaki, the White House press secretary now, is saying that the U.S. is not, not discussing any joint boycott of Olympics. The U.S. position on the 2022 Olympics hasn't changed. That's Jen Psaki. Coming up, Balance of Power continues for a second hour. We're going to talk some more about taxes with EY's America's International Tax and Transaction Services Leader. He is Craig Hillier. This is Bloomberg.